In this video, we'll be creating a cross-platform player controller using the Unity Input System. The Input System is a package that allows you to easily set up controls for multiple platforms. You can install it from the Package Manager, and it is a verified package for Unity 2019 LTS in newer versions of Unity. The project shown is available for download on GitHub following the link in the description below. If you want other information, check the Input System page. You can find the link in the description as well. In this Unity project, we have a character controlled by the keyboard. We can walk around using the WASD keys and we can use the spacebar to attack. The inputs are currently detected by the input manager. In the input manager, most of the work is done programmatically in script and it requires a lot of extra code to change the binding of the keys at runtime or switch the input device, such as keyboard, console game pads, or even touchscreen. We've introduced the Unity input system, which allows for simpler and more flexible input mapping, rebinding, and configuration for all types of projects and devices. Let's set up the input system and convert our player controller to use keyboard, gamepad, and mobile controls. To install the input system package, open Window, Package Manager. In the Open Package Manager window, scroll down through the available packages and select Input System. Let's install the package by clicking Install on the bottom right corner of the Package Manager window. Note that the input system comes with some useful samples that you can import into your project. Now that the input system package is added to the project, we are able to create a new asset that stores our input actions. Let's create it by clicking the right mouse button inside the project and select Create, Input Actions. Rename it Player Actions and double click to open the Input Actions Editor window. The Input Actions window is divided into three columns, Action Maps, Actions, and Properties. Let's start by creating an action map. Click on the plus button in the corner. An action map represents a set of controls dedicated to a particular mode of your game. For example, usually we want different controls in the pause menu compared to the gameplay. We may also want different controls for different modes of gameplay, such as walking versus driving. For this reason, action maps can also be switched at runtime using the switch current action map method. Let's name our new action map Player Controls. With this action map selected, we can create some actions by clicking the plus button in the upper corner of the second column. An action is something the player can do, such as move, attack, or jump. It shouldn't be inherently linked to a specific input or button and should be kept generic. We should define all the actions that our player can perform, and then we can define multiple bindings for each action, such as for different devices or platforms. Let's name our first action Attack. By selecting an action, we can change its properties in the third column. For Attack, we want to choose the button as the action type, since we just want to press a button to perform the attack. A button can be a keyboard key, a trigger, or a normal button on a gamepad. Let's create another action and name it Movement. This time, we want to choose the value as action type. The value type should be used for inputs which can track continuous changes, such as a joystick. Since we are using value, a second field is enabled. The control type represents the type of value we want in return. In this case, we'll use vector 2 to get the x-axis and y-axis of the joystick. On the attack action, if we click on the plus button, we can add a new binding. For this binding, we can now choose a path. This is how we define what the binding corresponds to. Here, we can find all the different types of inputs we can set up. From this options menu, we can manually search for the input that we want, navigate through the submenus, or use the search bar at the top. We can also click on listen to detect the input we push. Let's set the E key for the attack action. Now, let's click the plus button on the movement action. Here, we can add a binding or a 2D vector composite. The 2D vector composite option will create a 2D vector with up, down, left, and right. This makes sense for our movement action. Let's call this WASD keys. For each of these bindings, we can choose a path as we did for the attack. Let's set up the WASD keys as the binding for each direction. Now, to confirm our changes, we need to save the asset by clicking on the button at the top. Alternatively, we can enable the autosave feature using the flag on the left, which will save automatically when we edit the asset. This feature is off by default, so take care to switch it on or save the asset after any changes. Now that we have our input actions asset set up, we need an instance of it in the scene so we can detect input at runtime. 
This can be done by using a player input component. As our warrior character is what we want to control with this input actions asset, we can add the player input component to it. In the actions field, we can assign the actions asset. Another important field is the behavior that determines the way the player input component notifies that something has occurred. We're going to use invoke unity events. This way, all the actions will be exposed in the inspector as events and we can attach our callbacks to them. Besides the actions that we've defined, there are also some built-in ones such as on device lost or on controller changed. For a deeper explanation of all the behaviors, check the documentation linked below. Since we've set the Invoke Unity Events option, we need to declare in the player controller the callbacks for our actions and link them to the events in the inspector. For the movement, we declare the onMovement method. Here, we can access the parameter of type InputAction.CallbackContext, which is a data structure that contains all the information provided about what triggered this action. Calling the ReadValue generic method, we can read the Vector2 value and use it to override the movement vector. In a similar way, we implement the onAttack method. We read the started value, which is a Boolean that represents if the action has just started. In case started is true, we use the animator of the player to play the attack animation. In the inspector, we can now select the callbacks for each event. Clicking the plus button, we can add a new callback. For each callback, we have to select the object that holds the method that we want to use. And, from the right-hand menu, we choose what method to call, navigating through all the scripts that the selected object has. Let's add the callbacks for movement and attack. Now, we're able to move our player and attack using the input system. Before setting up our gamepad controls, we'll create a new control scheme for our keyboard. A scheme is a group of bindings for the actions that we can easily separate for different devices and their bindings. In the input window, click on All Control Schemes, Add Control Scheme. Let's call this keyboard and add the keyboard list to it. For each binding, we can choose which scheme they belong to. This also allows us to filter them in the selection above. Let's add all the bindings that we've created before to this new scheme. Now that everything is set up for the keyboard, we can do the same for the gamepad. Click again on All Control Schemes and select Add Control Scheme. This time, call it Gamepad. Let's create a new binding for the movement of our gamepad. Click on the plus button, Add Binding. In the Path field, select Gamepad. From here, we can choose input from a specific device like the PlayStation controller, the Switch controller, or we can choose a generic left stick that works for all supported gamepads. The same concept can be applied to the attack action. For gamepad button bindings, we can choose the position of the button that we want. For instance, the PlayStation controller has the X button in the same position as the A button on the Xbox controller and the B button on the Nintendo Switch Pro controller. We can just choose button south to cover all those cases. Now, if we press play, we are able to move and attack using a gamepad. The player input component will automatically detect the input we're using and assign it to the player so we can easily switch at runtime and use both the gamepad and the keyboard. There's a new input debugger that comes with the new input system package that can help us see all connected input devices and their inputs. You can find it under Window, Analysis, Input Debugger. Here we can see all the connected devices. This list is updated in real time, so if we connect or disconnect a device, we will immediately see it even if we are outside the play mode. If we double-click on a device, a dedicated window opens up. Here, we can find all the buttons that belong to this device. If we push a button, we can see that its value updates and an event is logged. The input system package also supports mobile. For example, in this canvas, we have the on-screen stick component that simulates the left stick of a generic gamepad. We can choose the control path to use from the inspector, just as we did in the input window. We have a similar component that simulates the buttons that is called on-screen button. This simulated gamepad is also visible in the input debug window. If we enter play mode, everything works as expected. We can use the simulated gamepad just like any of the other input devices. We can also spawn multiple warriors. Since the code is generic and the input device assigning is automatic, all we need is a loop to call the instantiation API to spawn the warriors prefabs. We can set the loop to how many warrior players we desire. 
Each warrior shares the same code and has a player input component on itself that allows it to be recognized as a player and detect the triggers of the actions. If we open the input debugger window during play mode, we can see that all the player inputs are shown. And for each player input, the relevant connected device is shown as well. The player input component also covers automatically the disconnection or the reconnection of a controller. These events are exposed and we can use them to implement custom logic. If you'd like to try out this example for yourself, this project is available on GitHub and linked in the description below. For more information, check the input system page linked below as well. Thanks for watching.